From the mid to late 90s, the collectathon subgenre within the 3D platformer genre was at the height of its popularity. With Super Mario 64 taking the gaming world by storm in 1996, its formula of sandboxy maps with various objectives therein would be imitated and expanded upon by tons of developers, including Rare with the Banjo series and Insomnia Games with Spyro the Dragon, and even licensed titles such as Toy Story 2 by Traveler's Tales took heavy inspiration from it. Naughty Dog was a developer though that very much stuck to the more traditional, linear side-scrolling platformer, flipped into 3D with the Crash Bandicoot series on the PlayStation due to the lack of an analog stick on those original PlayStation controllers. That said, after the rights to the Orange Marsupial had been lost to Universal Interactive Studios by 1998, and with the eons more powerful PlayStation 2 lurking on the horizon, Naughty Dog took the opportunity to create a new IP that would play more like those wildly popular collectors. It took a whole three years of development, but then Jack and Daxter The Precursor Legacy released in December of 2001. It received critical acclaim, averaging a 90% on game rankings, which is higher than any of the Crash titles scored, and it ended up becoming one of the best-selling classics of the entire PlayStation 2 library. Evidently, the game made a great impact back then, but considering that collectathons tend to have somewhat of a negative stigma attached to them these days, just how relevant relevant is the precursor legacy to play nearly two decades later. And did Naughty Dog do much to separate their efforts here from the numerous contemporaries? Let's dive in, shall we? The precursor legacy begins with a young lad Jack and his pal Daxter venturing off to Misty Island, a dangerous area located a few miles across the sea from their hometown, Sandover Village. Upon exploring the place, the duo pass by two ambiguous freaks and a group of listening lurkers, and later on find a giant pool of dark eco. At the same time, one of the lurkers notice Jack and Daxter's presence and assaults them, ultimately causing Daxter to plunder into the pool after Jack is knocked back from the straw the lurker. Daxter luckily poofs out of it, only he's been turned into an otzel, a weird cross between an otter and a weasel, and his response is something that, well, <laughs> let's just say something that's been ingrained into my brain forever. <laughs> Anime Boy and his pet return to Sandover Village to seek Old Samos the Sage's help to return Daxter to normal, but are informed that Gaul Acheron is the only sage who has this power. Problem is, Gaul lives to the north, far, far to the north, and some of the terrain is impossible to traverse by foot. Fortunately, Samos' daughter Kira brings a pleasant surprise, figuratively and literally, if you know what I mean, as she can power a vehicle she's working on to sustain the heat from Fire Canyon with enough power cells. The game's plot MacGuffins. I gotta say, by cartoony platformer standards, this is a bit of an unconventional setup. Often there's a hero and then a bad guy who's planning to take over the world and stolen a girlfriend while he's at it, but the precursor legacy instead makes the motivation for your adventure simply to help out a friend in need. There's no immediate threat or villain to speak of, which isn't anything major, but it's at least unique and different from the norm, and I like that. That said, there is more to the opening cinematic than just getting the ball rolling. It immediately establishes just some lore about the world you're in and the mysteries it holds, with a narrating Samos who spent his life searching for answers to questions that his father and his father's fathers failed to find. Who were the precursors, what was their purpose, and why did they vanish? Samos believes Jack is the one destined to uncover these answers, which is supported in the same opening and throughout the game with precursor artifacts reacting to Jack, and I like that these questions are never answered in this first game. That would be a bit anticlimactic, don't you think? Next Next to that, Eco is also contextualized as life's energy, and it's hinted at that there are varying forms of it with individual sages behind them, and this intro even foreshadows the main plot twist coming up much later. It's evident from these first six minutes that Naughty Dog wanted to take storytelling more seriously than they did with Crash. The story still isn't deep nor that much of a focus, but you already see the writers experimenting more with entertaining character interactions here, and they've given more thought to the world you'll be discovering and its origins. 
I get the impression the team was a bit too proud of their writing though, as well as their animation work and the performances delivered by the voice actors. Six minutes of exposition and creating motivation is a tad long for a 3D platformer, and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. I think the backstory stuff adds identity to the precursor legacy, but the fact you cannot skip cutscenes, yeah, that, that flat out sucks. Six minutes before you're in the action due to this opening can feel like an eternity if you are not interested in following the narrative, and the inability to give a miss to any cutscenes in general only accentuates the issue. None of them come close to an uninterrupted six minutes, thankfully, but a couple of obligatory ones are still over two minutes, and there are also optional NPCs you can talk to for certain power cells, which in extreme cases may go on for close to two minutes as well. It's perhaps not so bothersome the first playthrough, but when replaying Jack and Daxter, it can be pretty damn grating having to sit through all of that again, especially the opening. With all of that said, the first level we visit is Geyser Rock, an island dedicated to house the game's tutorial. Here, many of the fundamental concepts are explained and taught to the player, most importantly the three main collectibles. As stated before, power cells are the core collectible behind which progression is gated. You obtain them by completing whatever objectives the levels ask of you to complete, self-explanatory I think, and thank god you don't get booted out of a stage or whatever once a power cell is collected. It wouldn't even make sense in the context of this game to do that, and of course, preceding collectathons realized to cut that crap out already, but Nintendo would do it even with Super Mario Sunshine in 2002 for crying out loud, and the Ape Escape trilogy never quite got it right at all. One tier below the power cells in terms of value are the Scout Flies, with seven of these to be found in every single area. Similar to Mario 64's Red Coins, the Scout Flies are often used to incentivize exploration of the nooks and crannies in the levels, but sometimes getting them can also purely be a matter of overcoming obstacles. What makes them unique compared to the red coins is that they exhibit noise that raises or dampens in volume depending on distance, cluing attentive players in on nearby scout flies through sound design and thereby lowering the possibilities of frustration of just not being able to find one. What's also nice is that the last seven scout fly directly turns into a power cell, so you don't have to travel to a separate power cell location like you have to do with the stars for the red coins. Finally, we have the precursor orbs, coming in significantly larger quantities, from 50 per stage all the way up to 200. Most of these are in plain sight or packed into metal boxes that need forms of stronger force to be busted, giving you something to snoop up and be busy with as you're walking around in the areas, although every now and then the orbs can still be hidden away somewhere in clever spots. I like how these function more like the gems in Spyro, as in every orb you pick up, is permanently set in your pockets, rather than the 100 coin missions in Mario 64 or the music notes in Banjo-Kazooie. I think many people can relate to how soul-crushing it is to die in the latter two titles and having to start from scratch, recollecting all those coins or notes. Like the Scout Flies, Precursor Orbs also contribute to even more power cells, as there are a host of NPCs and these Precursor Sculptures willing to trade the two goods. A total of 2,000 orbs are stuffed into the game, though you'll only have to find 1530 of them in order to acquire all power cells. This is excellent because it means you don't have to aimlessly wanker around if you were to miss a handful. Simultaneously, I can't help but wonder if it would have been better for the required total for all power cells to be more along the lines of 1900 orbs. There'd still be decent headroom that you can miss orbs, but not so much that essentially a quarter of them can be freely ignored. Granted, this is a collectathon and the lion's share of players probably won't settle for anything anything less than the total of 2,000 orbs. This is also required for a 100% save file, but amassing 100 out of the 101 total power cells is the only task with an actual, extrinsic reward by the end. Now, does Guys Rock do a good job of introducing the game's most prominent concepts and collectibles? Yes, but also no. Yes, because functionally, it does teach you things and you cannot leave until you've got all four power cells here. So it's impossible for newcomers to immediately venture off into more difficult areas without understanding the basics, which could potentially make them put the game down due to a bad first impression. What's not so graceful is that you're literally stopped in place multiple times by Kira and Samos, who explain nonsense to you that's already illustrated fine through gameplay and visual design. For example, there's a precursor 
sensor door that needs to be opened while channeling Blue Eco. The door has a lightning icon at the top and the vent up ahead gives you a full charge as soon as you touch it. One plus one is two, right? Yep, but you're still interrupted with explanations for both the door and the vent. I understand the accessibility reasons behind doing this, but I don't think anybody needs their hands held that tightly, and especially kids hate listening to explanations, not to mention, their language may not even be in the game. What they elaborate on in the tutorial and what they don't is inconsistent too. You're interrupted to be told what various objects do, which for the most part speak for themselves really, yet training dummies are sort of dropped in for you to test your moves on with no comments on that, and scout fly boxes require a downward slam or uppercut to be busted, which is debatably the trickiest of all to figure out, yet there is only some dialogue referring to that? This makes Guys of Rock an inconsistent and slow tutorial, but thankfully you can turn play hints off, which mutes the assisting dialogue and prevents the game from stopping you in your tracks. Very much recommend using this option if you're even close to familiar with video games. The pace picks up well from here though, with the player set loose to go exploring at their own leisure. The game follows a typical collectathon structure of hub worlds with relatively few collectibles in them, which then branch off the three full-on proper stages that can largely be tackled in any order you wish. There are three hub worlds in the game, with the second and third becoming accessible after requiring a certain amount of power cells, and thus a total of nine main stages. Sandover Village is of course the first hub, and it's a small, peaceful place that quickly allows you to reach your next destination, and it shows the player that scout flies are actually not cluttered in one section, which is how it was in Geyser Rock, but instead spread out for you to find them all. Those NPCs that you trade precursor orbs with in exchange for power cells are located here too, as they are in all the hub worlds, though this village is the only hub in the game with its own self-contained task. This task is to butt smack a handful of loose yakows back into their panel. It's an odd but amusing distraction the first time, primarily due to the sounds produced from this endeavor. But on subsequent playthroughs, the shit is kind of pace-breaking. It takes like a minute to do, and there's nothing fun about it beyond the initial novelty. Anyway, there are two stages accessible from here off the bat. Sentinel Beach and Forbidden Jungle. Sentinel Beach is the one Say most guides the player towards after Geyser Rock, so let's head down there and see what we got. Sentinel Beach, in some ways, is like a well-disguised extension of the tutorial, teaching you some things that are handy to know of and of value down the road. Early on in the stage, you encounter the metal boxes containing precursor orbs that I've mentioned before. This is meant to teach you that the only way to break these open is via greater force, in this case the bomb fired off from the nearby tower, which you have to lure in the right place by standing next to the boxes you want to explode. There are also some orbs in the water very close by, letting you know you can swim and dive, and in order to obtain one of the scout flies sitting on a higher platform, you have to sure you can some pulls up from below, highlighting the uppercut move. Furthermore, Sentinel Beach is by far the easiest stage in the game, being pretty wide open and allowing you to explore almost all of its inches with fairly little effort. It consists of a lot of flat land with only basic and non-punishing platforming, and the enemies are unthreatening, almost defenseless, such as the worms rising out of the ground with a very clear telegraph, or the crabs inside their shells that you can knock around. Additionally, in case you're in danger of dying, the green eco-collectors that say most orders you to unblock offer a full replenishment of health instantly, so even the most inexperienced players should be able to have a comfortable time here. Most of the power cells are straightforward to acquire too. Two of them are just kind of chilling there, out in the open, asking no more of you than your ability to walk and jump, and unblocking Samos's green eco fence is as simple as punching, kicking, or slamming the rocks on top of them. I don't really have an issue with these objectives being so simple, but maybe the five eco fence could have at least been spread across the stage more for extra exploration and efficiency of getting that full life restore when you need it. That said, there are some objectives that are not as obvious or require a bit more dexterity. The route to the bird egg on the cliff, for example, is fairly narrow with some gaps in between and enemies on them, and if you were to fall off at any point, you have to walk back to the start of the route as well. There's also that pelican that swallows that power cell from the beach, which you have to attack for it to spit out the stolen goods, and then the player has to be mildly fast to snag the power cell back before the bird does so. Fun fact, when the pelican is sitting in his nest with the power cell still swallowed, you can actually blow it up with the cannon on top of the tower to avoid the hassle of racing it. God dang, dude, that's dark. What's with all the animal abuse so far? 
Now, Sentinel Beach may be a pushover of a level if you have any resemblance of skill and experience with the Precursor Legacy, but it still manages to be a fun level to traverse in spite of that, I think. Outside of the inherent satisfaction of collecting stuff and cleaning out that many fans of Collectathons love, something you may or may not do, the area is pretty small in size and laid out in such a fashion that it's pretty painless to go where you want at any time. Swimming between the two shores is especially a fast method to going from one side of the map to the other. It's also an easy stage to master due to its low difficulty, so especially on repeat playthroughs, Sentinel Beach really shouldn't take long at all to complete. It's very much possible in well under 10 minutes. And then there's the environment itself, man. It is absolutely beautiful to look at with the waterfall going on, the plant life and lush greens, the sentinels themselves, the windmills. Don't be surprised if you find yourself just soaking in the scenery at a high vantage point and enjoying that by itself. The music is gorgeous too, perhaps the most gorgeous out of the whole soundtrack. It's so soothing and it really sets the mood for such a peaceful beach. Another aspect that helps in making Sentinel Beach a fun level to play, even for experienced players, and what absolutely adds to Jack and Daxter as a whole for that matter, are the controls and movement. The controls in this game are simply excellent. Jack is very responsive to how you're tilting the analog stick, stopping on a dime from a walk with no delay, going in another direction when you push the stick more moderately, and snapping to the other direction when you flick the stick quickly enough. Jumps also have a nice amount of weight to them. Jack isn't floaty with all forward momentum halting as soon as you let go of the stick, but it never feels as if he's too heavy or carries so much momentum that he overshoots platforms without constant compensation. The double jump can take some getting used to though, as the time window in which you have to initiate it is kind of vague and tight, and you're pretty committed to your jumps. Even if you double jump, you won't gain a lot of distance in case you want to correct the bad one. These quirks can lead to a couple of unmerited deaths or moments of taking damage when you you're still learning the controls. At the same time, if you ask me, these are issues minor in the grand scheme of things, and this is in part thanks to the spin kick. This can be used to extend the length of your jumps as well as slightly the height with the correct timing, and is available from the start. It forms a great safety net because it allows you to change direction in midair much more effectively and comfortably, and the spin kick can be activated much more freely with no strict timings, so it's very forgiving to pull off. Of course, Jack isn't capable of solely running and jumping either. No, 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 no. His moveset is a lot more diverse and intricate than that. There's a crouch jump that can reach higher than the regular double jump, a forward lunging punch, a downward slam into the ground, the aforementioned uppercut slash sure you can attack, a long jump through the roll maneuver, and more. And combining these moves in certain ways or timing stuff within them adds an additional layer of complexity to the controls. For example, if you want to reach the height of a crouch jump but don't want to stand still to do so, so, you can hold jump while performing the downward slam to launch yourself higher up, and if you hit jump again at just the right time as your long jump hits the ground, Jack gains that same height while maintaining the momentum from that long jump into the high jump. God, all that shit sounded more confusing when it was read out loud. This can be a tricky dicky to pull off, especially when long jumping off of higher terrain, but if done correctly, it can get you to places so much more efficiently and quickly, and it looks mighty fancy to boot. Where stuff like this really begins to shine is in taking shortcuts, reaching places in imaginative ways, and applying the right techniques in the right scenarios to optimize speedruns. Long jumping is the fastest method of travel in the game, but you have to keep in mind the spacing of the role, as some platforms platforms are too narrow to start a long jump from, and thus will cause you to fall off and lose time instead. You also have to pre-calculate where Jack is going to land, because a long jump cannot be interrupted once activated, and you cannot change Jack's direction at all until you land. It's not at all uncommon to long jump straight into a hazard or pit if you make a mistake. Truthfully, I could go on considerably longer about the depth of the moveset and the stunts possible with it when applied appropriately in the stages, but the moral of the story is 
is that the controls in the Precursor Legacy aren't merely good on a surface level, so in the sense of being responsive and accessible, they're also satisfying to master for those willing to push their skills to the next level. This is definitely one of those games where the controls and moves alone can make even the simplest of platforming sections enjoyable. The cherry on top is the superb animation. Jack is animated in a very stretchy and squashy manner, making him feel cartoony and agile, and his variety of moves can string together so smoothly. You can go from uppercuts to boosted downward slams to mid-air spin kicks to long jumps once you reach the ground and almost everything in between so seamlessly, and it lends a marvelous feel to the character in both his functionality as well as aesthetic. I found this lacking in the Banjo titles, for instance, where the speed of Banjo and the flow for move to move feels awkward and clunky by comparison. In conclusion, Jack is definitely one of my favorite characters to be the boss over in any 3D platformer. I think he's only beaten by Mario and his unbelievably intricate and versatile moveset in combination with the Flood in Sunshine. With that behind us, Forbidden Jungle is the area we're on to next, and it is definitely the more challenging area over Sentinel Beach. More hazards and enemies, tighter jumps, and more potential to fall down the stage and then having to climb back up. This is an area that gives me a good opportunity to talk about the level design quality that Jack and Daxter hold steady throughout a lot of its runtime. With Sentinel Beach being somewhat of an exception, all the main stages in this game have the player platforming around, participating in light combat with enemies, or avoiding obstacles almost every step of the way. As soon as you enter Forbidden Jungle, you see a bunch of precursor orbs and narrow pillars to jump between, and when you venture off to the left, there's a path with bridges to cross with small gaps in between patches of spikes to hop over here and there, and swinging spike logs that you have to avoid by running past them at the right intervals. You'll also be climbing the large precursor temple in the center of the level, which sees the player using bouncy trampolines to get higher up and jumping from moving platform to moving platform, and then inside the temple itself is the most lethal platforming over bottomless pits. While every stage is obviously constructed and laid out differently from Forbidden Jungle, virtually all of them follow this same respectable practice of integrating many obstacle courses and platforming parts into these sandbox-esque exploration-based maps. It's like taking chunks of the levels from the Crash titles and spreading the content within them out rather than connecting them in a linear fashion. It's a setup I overall enjoy and I'm happy to see the game maintaining so well for the majority of the journey, since it prevents the game from becoming an exploration for the sake of exploration affair, which I have revealed this like towards before. Sure, the complexity and difficulty of the platforming and combat in Jack and Daxter isn't noteworthy on the set pieces you have to return to or maybe crossing multiple times in order to get around, the more difficult stuff is usually reserved for separated sections only, but the potential for messing up and taking damage or dying remains there and is valid and it keeps the player busy. Next to Jack's rich and smooth handling, this aspect of the level design forms an important reason, regardless of more specific positives and negatives I may bring up on a particular stage, why all the stages in the game are both fun to traverse and explore. I'm not implying the Precursor Legacy is the only collectathon to do this, but all you need is Danka Kang 6 to 4 for a star comparison, where there's a bunch of walking across flat land, just snooping up bananas and whatnot, cause woohoo, this is a collectathon, you collect an insane number of things, that's enough to make a video game exciting. Fuck me, does DK64 make my dong retract? Anyway, uh, inside the Precursor Temple of the Forbidden Jungle resides the first of three bosses in the game. It's a dark eco-plant, and the design of the fight is akin to something to what you'd find in Crash. In other words, it follows the formula of an attack phase, the boss then revealing its weak spot, you hitting it, and this cycle repeating two more times with a slight ramp in difficulty each time. It's obviously not hard to beat, but the plant lunging forward to bite you can be a little unpredictable despite its telegraph, especially on cycle 2 and 3, where it attempts to bite you two or three times in quick succession. If I could make a suggestion to make the battle a tad more interesting, it would have been to remove the bottom leaf on cycle two and both leaves on cycle three, forcing players to perform an attack out of a jump and then out of a double jump for the final blow. The remaining objectives in Forbidden Jungle worth commenting on are the energy beam reflectors and the fishing minigame. The energy beam reflectors strike me as a bit of a wasted inclusion because as soon as you find the first beam, the location of the following one is pointed out to you with a cutscene and even a pointer as you're aiming. I'm not really sure what this adds to the stage at all besides extra traveling and having to watch more cutscenes you cannot skip, so 
I wish a different mission could have taken its place. As for the fishing minigame, it sees Jack trying to catch 200 pounds of fish while avoiding the purple eels, which restart you from scratch upon catching even one. It's a minigame primarily based on reaction, sometimes having to steer the nets all the way across the river, with the fish swimming in faster and faster as you advance. It is interesting enough while it lasts, but the net is sadly a bit hard to handle precisely, which could lead to some frustrating fails. The minigame being included and being a bit jank doesn't bother me much, but what I do care for is that the third stage of the first hub, Misty Island, is locked behind the completion of it. Minigames are mostly harmless in my eyes if they're optional, and though you can reach the final boss here without successfully doing the fishing, I have to imagine a kid missing out on an entire level due to the fact he or she couldn't beat a minigame that disregards the game's base mechanics. That would be a shame, honestly, so I'ma say Misty Island being unlocked via the energy beam reflectors or something else at least would have been a better idea. Speaking of Misty Island, that's our third and last stop before moving on from Sandover Village. The difficulty here is raised a little once again, though not as much as before. As you go straight from the entrance, there is a section with a lot of smaller pits to fall into, and you'll be jumping onto narrow walkways and away from collapsing floors before you drop down. You also find lurker enemies that chase you upon being spotted, swinging around their bones to extend their range of damage, and getting hit by that or dealing your first blow gives a small amount of knockback, which possibly has you falling off and dying instantly. Thankfully, you get a chance to fight these guys in advance on a massive save ground, so the knockback is communicated to the player before putting them into more lethal predicaments. There's also a bridge leading to the top of the island, which sports a linear platforming challenge of avoiding logs rolling and bumping down, though dodging the logs is pretty simple work. An obvious way they could have made this part a touch more interesting is by ramping up the speed and or frequency of the logs coming down per chunk of the bridge, with three chunks in total as it is already. I also see some missed potential with the seesaws. A handful of these are spread across the stage, but interacting with them is never obligatory. It's easy to imagine a scenario where the player would have to slam into one side of the seesaw multiple times to launch themselves higher and higher and eventually grab onto a ledge above, but alas, no such thing happens. A part I really liked about Misty Island, though, is how it uses Blue Eco. So, Blue Eco has been used before and is very prevalent throughout the game. It's a temporary power-up, the duration of which depends on how many balls you've picked up, and the meter instantly maxes out via these concentrated vents. Blue Eco has a few properties, beginning with that it gives you a speed boost when running, and it automatically attracts items and breaks boxes in close proximity. It doesn't give Jack any special moves or anything, but it does feel pretty empowering to be charged up in Blue Eco regardless, also in part thanks to the satisfying sound and sense of motion in the particle effects. While channeling Blue Eco, it also allows you to activate precursor artifacts. Think of platforms that begin moving, locked doors that open, and jump paths that don't launch you up otherwise. Now, where there is often plenty of Blue Eco available to you to more than comfortably reach an artifact of interest, like here in Forbidden Jungle to obtain this power cell, Misty Island gives you fairly limited Blue Eco resources. This makes it more challenging to open the artifacts because you're on a time limit and thus have to be quick. It's a concept to design designers use a few more times, like once here in Rock Village, or once in the Lost Precursor City in a room where you have to activate all artifacts in the room on one blue eco charge or else they all deactivate, and it's always neato when they do use this concept. On the topic of eco, Misty Island also introduces a new variant of it, namely Red Eco. Unfortunately, this is the most underwhelming shit. It basically enhances the strength of Jack for as long as he's charged, allowing him to take out foes such as the lurkers in this stage with one one hit, eliminating the knockback effect. It's also necessary in Snowy Mountain to burn the shields of these arsats, but that's really the extent of Red Eco, no new abilities or anything, and it only ever shows up in three levels to boot. Maybe Red Eco would have been worth more if combat was a more involved, challenging aspect of the game, but for the most part, combat acts as a brief distraction to give players something to do when they aren't platforming or collecting items. It is not meant to be an in-depth activity, and you know, that's totally okay. Now, 
nevertheless, that doesn't stop Misty Island from at one point locking you into a room and unleashing a boatload of enemies onto you at once in an ambush. There's next to no strategy in surviving this though, it largely boils down to spamming spin kicks and punches and keeping some distance. Red Eco is dropped in abundance by defeated foes too, so there's no element of like managing your Red Eco and reserving it for the tougher waves with tougher enemies. The game has a total of four of these combat ambushes as well, and while they're all a little different, one may see you using a different type of eco, and another may have you going through a lurker infested cave you need to reach the end of without dying, none of them are all that interesting due to the combat elements not being so deep. At the same time, they aren't awful, and most of these don't even last a minute, so these combat ambushes write them off as lukewarm attempts at evolving the combat a bit, and we simply move on. As for some other objectives I enjoyed in Misty Island, well, one of them has you chasing a muse, and this thing is pretty darn fast on its feet. I've heard complaints how catching it is irritating and even frustrating to some extent, but I have no problems with it. The muse runs and hops around in a pretty confined area with some obstructions and enemies, so I simply view it as a method of getting players to show some decent skill with Jack's movement to catch up, as well as get a decent grasp of how the layout here is constructed to clear obstacles faster and to take shortcuts. Lastly, the stage also contains a section dedicated to the zoomer. Seeing how this is likely going to be the player's introduction to the mechanic, the area you're driving around in here has enough open space to get used to the handling, speed, and jumping of the vehicle, and then when the player feels ready, they can display some precision with the vehicle to get power cells. Driving over the wooden planks with two sharp turns that force you to slow down, and lurkers carried by balloons that you have to slam into while avoiding collision with the two surrounding mines. It's a nice break from the platforming and adds a bit of variety to Misty Island as a stage. Once 20 power cells are collected in Sandover Village and its surrounding areas, players can choose to progress to the second hub world. They'll have to cross the Fire Canyon first though, a linear stage with the zoomer being the means of travel. The main concept here is that the shield of your zoomer can only sustain so much heat, so you're gonna have to avoid contact with the patches of lava as much as possible, while also trying to catch air off of the terrain and pop cooling balloons to prevent the vehicle from exploding. Loading. There are some pitfalls and obstructions to avoid too, and you don't want to miss a precursor orb container or scout fly along the way, as having to turn around and waste time may push the temperature too high before you clear the course. The game has three of these linear zoomer levels in total, and though none of them are particularly special, they provide enough depth for the short times they last. They're fun diversions before diving back into the next set of core stages. Upon arrival at the second hub area, Rock Village, the rest of the gang is teleported over via a warp gate. This happens every time Jack and Daxter travel to a new hub, which not only allows Kira and Samos to go there easily, but it also acts as a method of quick travel between hubs. If you're at the final boss and need to go back to Volcanic Crater for instance, well, you can do just that swiftly without having to actually travel there. It's a nice bit of convenience. Now, in Rock Village itself, we find out that the town is being bombarded with flaming boulders by Claw, this giant creature at the top of the hills. Jack, and Daxter, I suppose, will have to face Claw, but access to it has been blocked off by a gigantic boulder that can only be lifted with, you guessed it, more more power cells. So there's the excuse for continuing your collectathon journey, and since effectively no plot significance or story progression takes place here, now seems like an appropriate moment to bring up the characters themselves. The main cast is the one established at the beginning, Jack, Daxter, Samos, and Kira. Out of all of them, I think it's safe to say Daxter is the fellow to spring to mind for most people whenever they think of the series. This has very little to do with how the story is a reaction to his ear-grating furry fate, and more with how he seems to have the most amount of effort put into him. He's the sidekick with an overly high inflated opinion of himself, always looking for ways to put the spotlight on himself. I'm Daxter. Who's Jack? He's with me. Good job, Daxter. You're a real hero. And he is not afraid to share his opinion on the folks he meets and their circumstances with wisecracking remarks. Judging by the smell, I'd wager your bathtub sank in the mud long ago. What's a bathtub? In reality, however, he is a total wuss, as you would expect. Uh, aren't there a lot of um, lurker sharks in that water? Why? Are you scared? Me? Of course not. Just looking out for Jack here. You, uh, you know what a 
chicken he can be. Many of his lines are genuinely charming and entertaining, and that type of witty, smart-ass personality fits in well with the overall light-hearted nature of the narrative. That said, I do feel that sometimes the writers missed the mark on making Daxter a likable twat and ended up making him come off more like a full-on twat. He cannot take anything seriously besides his own rodent problem. All he can think about when Kira is distressed is trying to hit on her, for example, and the thanks Jack gets from Daxter for traveling all the way across the continent to save his furry mug is being blamed for the incident in the first place, even though Jack was trying to protect him. It's probably all played for laughs, but to me, those obnoxious instances do detract a bit from the character, and there's no sort of development to becoming a hair less of an asshole. Like, are we supposed to feel bad for this dude or what? I still enjoy Daxter in the Precursor Legacy as his good moments outshine the bad in my opinion, and he's a truly unique character. I'm just glad the sequels bring the exact sort of refinement to Daxter that he needed. I adore him in Jack 2, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Right behind Daxter, I would say Samos is the most fleshed out character of the main cast. He's the old wise sage, much more so than Alec Alger the side quest gamer could ever hope to be, and he's really the person with the largest fascination for the precursors and with the greatest understanding of Eco. Many people are stubborn though and don't heed his wisdom, resulting in Samos being easily grumpy. That grumpiness is precisely what makes him a good one. His dynamic with Daxter especially is enjoyable and the strongest in the game from my point of view. These two clearly have mixed feelings towards one another, which leads to them dissing and trash talking with practically every opportunity presented, and this is always a good time for me. And, then and Daxter, you finally took a much needed bath, but in a bathtub filled with dark eco. Look, old man, are you gonna keep yapping or are you gonna help me out of this mess? I'm gonna keep yapping, because in my professional opinion, the change is an improvement. Not only is Savage Samos an enjoyable Samos, but it also gives Daxter a justification for being the bastard he is, which in turn makes his lines and behavior likable instead of grating. Samos is also kind of hard on Jack, downplaying his achievements throughout the journey, but it's obvious from his delivery that Samos gradually becomes more and more impressed and believes more and more in Jack's abilities. You keep on impressing me. But then maybe it's just because I've got low expectations. Okay, your moment of gloating is over. Get on with it! By the end of the game, he even properly views Jack as a hero and congratulates him, giving their dynamic a satisfying conclusion. Samos' development like that is a reason I want to say he is one of my favorite characters in this first installment, and all those times he is being a douchebag, it's more endearing since he feels like a well-intended douche. He doesn't interact much with Kira though, which is odd considering she's his daughter. I wouldn't want them to have forced interactions, but maybe Samos could have shown displeasement toward Kira getting hit on by Jack and Dad or something? I know it wasn't always appreciated when I did that shit. Speaking of Kira, she's not bad, honestly. She's the mechanic of the group, comparable to Coco in a sense, and I like that she's an independent young lady rather than another damsel in disguise. She's always focused on the missions at hand, yet very chill and collected in her delivery. When she sends Jack and Daxter across hot lava on the Zoomer, for example, there's no sign of concern over them burning alive. She simply wishes the two good luck and trusts in their ability, reads Jack's ability, to survive. I find that pretty cool about Kira. She's anything but a drama queen and it also never fails to amuse me how she rejects Daxter's attempts at flirting. She just ain't having any of it, much to Daxter's dismay. Wait! Uh, I'll stay here and protect Kira. Jack, I think you're ready to handle that monster without me. Oh, really heroic of you. And that just leaves us with Jack himself, who's actually a mute. His body language makes him appear as a confident guy, even in the face of danger, but that's the extent of what I can say about him. Jason Rubin himself has stated that this was a very conscious decision to have the player be able to take the role of Jack, but he's declared in retrospect that it was a mistake to give Jack no speech. I agree with that, I mean, I don't think people would want to stop playing if Jack's personality wasn't to their liking, and while the game probably would not gain a whole lot from having having Jack talk, it would have been nice to see him interact more with the crew, especially Daxter. The two are friends, yeah, but besides Jack sometimes face palming or grinning at his animal buddy when he's being stupid, there's little connection or bonding between them that I can feel. They're no ratchet and clang from the first outing, that's for sure. The side characters in Jack and Daxter aren't the greatest either. I can't say I care about most of the folks in your hometown, as nobody there seems to give a monkeys about Daxter being turned into an odd soul or Jack going on a dangerous road trip. And 
And frankly, they're simply boring people with pathetic NPC problems that you have to solve in exchange for power cells. Beyond Sandover Village, the number of fellas you run into isn't high to begin with, and not all of these leave any sort of impression, like the fisherman and the lady with her lightning moles. There's nothing I can say about them, really. I do like the melancholic dude with his story about getting his cheeks spanked by Claw and how he tries to act like a valiant warrior amidst his depression, and the dynamic between the agitated and frustrated Gordy and the brain dead, albeit more friendly Willard is pretty memorable. It's not like all of these side characters suck and are complete wastes, but I do find most of them rather bland. With the talk about characters out of the way, let's get back into gameplay, shall we? As you're going through Rock Village, the first area you're likely to cross by is Precursor Basin. This main stage is unique amongst all others in Jack and Daxter for being done entirely on the zoomer, and it's probably my least favorite part of the game. The reason is not that the controls are bad or whatever, the zoomer plays well with a comfortable speed to handle and it's got a lightweight feel to it that makes steering left or right near instantaneous. It does have a bit of a massive turning radius when holding the acceleration button, but sharp turns can still be taken properly by slamming the brakes, letting go of the gas, etc. So that's fine and straightforward. My problem instead is that the mechanics are too easy to master. For a first playthrough, I think this isn't a concern. There are a variety of objectives within Precursor Basin, so an intricate set of movement mechanics isn't as important to keeping the gameplay feeling fresh and exciting. On subsequent playthroughs, however, I've always found the mechanics and control with more depth to them in any game help tremendously in keeping stages and objectives you've already completed more interesting. This is a dilemma though because asking players to learn a whole new set of complex mechanics just to do the zoomer sections that aren't the main focus of the game would be questionable. However, at the same time, I'm pulled away from Jack's core moveset for one full level to control a vehicle far more basic by comparison. I admit I cannot come up with the proper answer to this dilemma except except maybe having all stages focus mainly on platforming, with a couple of those stages sporting one or two zoomer objectives, much like Misty Island. In doing that, the time spent on the zoomer at once is never as long as a full level, and so the limited complexity of the mechanics never becomes too bothersome. On the flip side, I also realize others may really enjoy having a whole area dedicated to mess around in on the zoomer, so there's no right or wrong answer in this situation, or speaking of a flaw per se, it's a matter of taste. One of the missions in Precursor Basin is also a culprit for me, usually not looking forward to the stage too much, that being the lightning moles that need to be scared back into their hole by following them around. It's not the chasing aspect of it that bugs me, it's the fact you're busy influencing the AI rather than trying to best it. The moles don't always go where you want them to, and they may even refuse to jump into the hole despite running right over it, meaning half of completing this task is essentially hoping for the best. See, now two of them plopped in at once. There's no rhyme or reason to this shit. Chasing the four flying lurkers isn't too exciting either. They always seem to move out of the way last second for me, regardless of how clean my movement around the obstacles may be. Until at some point in the second or third loop, they just run out of breath or something and slow down, allowing me to easily catch up. To this objective's credit, at least there seems to be more skill and precision involved with catching the lurkers than with chasing the mole, so it's better than that. On the bright side, there are decent missions in Precursor Basin as well. Navigating the purple and blue Precursor Rings is a good activity, for example. In order to obtain these two power cells, one for each color, you have to drive through each subsequent ring that appears after passing the last one. You only have a limited amount of time to go from one ring to the other, and failing to keep up at any point resets the whole series, so it's satisfying to perform big jumps off of rock, do sharp turns to lose as little time as possible, and cross narrow paths while maintaining high speed. Acquiring the hang of the zoomer is certainly certainly necessary for this, however simplistic its mechanics may be. Every now and then, these precursor ring objectives do feel somewhat reliant on trial and error though, since it's not always readily apparent where the next ring appears, and when that happens, it can feel a bit unfair having to start over. There's also a race through a specially built track, with interfering precursor artifacts, and there's one part where you have to do a sharp 180 to advance. It's pretty simplistic stuff, and the time limit of 45 seconds feels pretty generous. Maybe there could have been multiple rewards war tiers with lower times required 
required, each giving you different collectibles, but it's fine for what it is. What I appreciate about Precursor Basin, lastly, is the layout itself. It's a small area where you can go from the entrance to the outer corners in no time flat with the zoomer speed, making it painless to move from mission to mission or restart one when needed, and it's still open-ended with heaps of Precursor orbs and the typical 7 scout flies to snoop up. Many of these are found through the usual exploration, but sometimes you'll have to perform jumps from ramps or hop between platforms with gaps to fall into in between, and I like how all that keeps the zoomer in line with the fundamentals of a platformer. Still, I'm not the biggest fan of Precursor Basin. It's completely competent level design-wise, far from bad. It's not like I hate going through this stage or something. It's just one of the lesser moments of Jack and Daxter for me. Thankfully, I've got good news as we follow up what is possibly my least favorite stage in the game with one of my favorite stages in the game, Lost Precursor City. There is simply an outstanding host of challenges to tackle here, starting with the two scout flies in Power Cell getting sucked to a different location by pressing the corresponding switch and you having to grab them before time runs out. A more inexperienced player would have to get around in this room as well as reach the scout flies with a set of pretty slow platforms you stand on to make the other rotate around you, but a player moderately familiar and skilled with Jack's moveset can achieve the same results by long jumping over gaps just right or crouch jumping to reach the higher ledges. The path to the power the path to the path to the the route to the power cell doesn't have that going for it, but it does require you to keep up a decent pace while jumping onto and between a series of platforms extending and retracting from the wall. Up until now, the game hasn't done any sort of time-based challenge besides some stuff with the blue eco, and it puts a bit of pressure on players that could make them more prone to making mistakes. Then there are the two slide segments akin to Mario 64's, meaning you cannot stop Jack from moving forward and gotta steer him left and right and jump at the right intervals to avoid hazards and amass all the precursor orbs as you advance further down. It's a nice bit of variety unique to the Lost Precursor City, and you can manipulate Jack's sliding speed by pushing forward or backwards on the analog stick, as well as kill yourself to get back to the top in case you miss an item. So it's a comfortable time with an easy way to reset. There's also the section where you have to activate a large group of platforms by jumping on them to acquire a power cell, land on the same platform again, and it deactivates, so there's a minor puzzle element present there, and the stage concludes with a fairly intense spiral tower climb of sorts. Instant kill Dark Eco is rising below your ass at all times here, the same extending and retracting platforms from before return, and there are some foes interfering on top of that. All these shenanigans make for good platforming entertainment, and nearly every room has something new on offer for players to indulge in, keeping the level exciting as you go through it. Since the Lost Precursor City is found in the second hub, the difficulty is amped up over Forbidden Jungle and Misty Island too. There are overall fewer safe places to stay end, with most of the ground being made up of water that is either periodically or continuously electrified, and you'll have to deal more with loose platforms sort of floating around in the environment. I also think it's noteworthy how you have to lure these spinning fellas into precursor boxes, otherwise unbreakable in this area right here, because you're manipulating an enemy into performing an action that is to your advantage. The only other instance I can recall where that happens is when setting yourself up as a target for the cannons, as to blow up precursor orb crates in Sentinel Beach and miss the island, and I think it'd be welcomed if the game sported more stuff similar to that since it's combat approach from a different angle. Maybe these guys with the drills in the later Spider Cave could have been used to create cracks in a set of crystals or whatever, revealing a scout fly inside. I don't know, just spitballing ideas here. If I had to give a suggestion to improve the Lost Precursor City to a small degree, it would be in regards to the layout. It's a more linear stage than anything before it, connecting its rooms and hallways in a rather sequential order and that's not necessarily a negative. Most of the chambers themselves are still fairly open with choices of what to do first and last, and the sections that make more sense to be linear, well, they are linear. However, I feel the level isn't the most efficient to trek through in case you're looking for something you've missed, and leaving the Rock Village could be a mild annoyance in that scenario too. There is an extra entrance slash exit point available near the end, thankfully, but if you leave that one behind on the surface and come back through the main entrance, you can only exit through that main entrance 
anymore. Perhaps it would have been better if the stage was like structured in floors, each floor branching out to various rooms with their own challenges if need be, and you could freely move between floors with an elevator. The slide segments could then be formed in downward circles as alternate means of advancing to a lower floor, and the spiral tower climb could loop back from the bottom of the level to the top for the players that clear everything out in the top to bottom order anyway. Despite the nitpick, Lost Precursor City is pretty awesome as I've said, and the atmosphere is certainly a contributor to that. This starts with the music sporting a mellow and relaxing, yet mysterious track with the added effects of Precursor Metal clashing and the noises from the water to enhance the immersion. Further enhancing the atmosphere is the visual design, which strikes me as the most unique in the game. Most of the location types in Jack and Daxter are typical for platformers, beaches, jungles, swamps, and though they're all strongly realized in their own right, the Lost Precursor City stands out because it's an architecture built by the Precursors. It ties into the whole lore behind them. I cannot think of anything quite like this place in other platformers or games, period, despite the underwater aesthetic, and it truly feels alive. The lighting effects are fantastic for the day too, with the water emitting this bright green light whenever electricity flows through it, and the heated pipes being surrounded by an animate, warm glow. The game in general is graphically impressive by PlayStation 2 standards. Naughty Dog implemented various technologies such as multiple rendering engines and at the time advanced runtime physics in order to create the large, expansive levels they envisioned while keeping the visual fidelity high. There's a plethora of neat particles effects like puffs of smoke when hitting the ground, all the breaks of water within large bodies of waterfalls, the forms of eco and the sense of energy they contain through their motions, and there's cool distortion tricks like the heat hazes when looking through flames or other hot spots, or when standing on a launch pad with blue eco channeling through Jack's body. Effects like this are present in abundance. When you put Jack and Daxter up against Ratchet and Clank, the latter released a year later by the way, there isn't even a competition. Ratchet while certainly a good-looking title on its own for PS2, contains blurrier textures and the environments in contrast overall appear more primitive and less detailed, I guess. Spyro could never hold the candle to crash in terms of sheer graphical complexity either because Spyro wasn't as restricted and linear, but now the comparison is totally fair because Jack has maps grand in scope like Ratchet, as well as a user-controllable camera and, well, it still looks better. The only aspect of the pre Curse of Legacy's graphics that hasn't held up is the modeling, more specifically the modeling of the characters. It's not really noticed in gameplay, and that is most important, but during the cutscenes, with all the close-ups on the character models, they look rough to the degree that it's actually distracting 17-some years later. I'll definitely give Ratchet and Clank the honor on this front, with the main duo especially still looking relatively pleasant, even in cutscenes. Regardless, there's no denying Jack and Daxter is one heck of a technical achievement, because it is also the first 3D platformer that boasts a completely interconnected world, almost entirely free of intrusive loading. Notwithstanding Geyser Rock, you can go from the beginning all the way to the final boss and every single area in between without the screen cutting the black for loading. With an overload of gigantic open world titles these days on modern systems now, the premise of interconnected locations and dynamic loading is hard to get too excited excited about, but in the context of 2001 and the hardware, what Naughty Dog pulled off was practically unheard of. Getting such a seamless world running required several level of detail systems operating in the background, continuous on-the-fly streaming from the DVD, and a lot of meticulous design work. There's use of low polygon environment models swapped out for full detail versions with collision and all once you get close, and tricks like sneaky camera manipulation or lurker sharks in the water to prevent players from swimming around boundaries are used frequently to prevent players from being exposed to severe pop-in at all costs. In very rare cases, Jack can even trip seemingly randomly, which in actuality happens when you moved faster than the game accounted for and needs just a bit of extra time for transferring data over to memory. What a bunch of naughty dogs, but 
clever ones nonetheless. Oh, and did I mention the 60 frames while rarely missing a beat part? Sometimes the frame rate may dip to 30 with some pixelation as a result due to the interlaced rendering, but these dips are so brief and infrequent that for all intents and purposes, you're pretty much locked in at a solid 60 FPS. It's evident that an insane amount of effort went into the engineering side of things to optimize performance by Andy Gavin and other team programmers because the PlayStation 2 was not known for being friendly hardware to work with, especially so early on in the console's life. It's an aspect about Jack and Daxter that really, really deserves to be recognized. That said, the technology and design wasn't 100% flawless. There are instances of geometry plainly warping or expanding in front of you depending on distance, and catching glimpses of pop-in on distant objects is not difficult if you're specifically paying attention to that stuff. This is to be expected to some extent though, because the draw distance is virtually unlimited with no fog unless artistically intended. I also hesitate to call the game actually 100% load free because some segments act more like well disguised load times. Going to Misty Island for example has you sitting in a boat crossing part of the sea with the camera angled to hide pop in as much as possible and the same goes for when the gondola takes you up the snowy mountain from the volcanic crater. These are cutscenes too with control actively being taken away and the elevator rides or hallways locked down with doors while technically still gameplay hide nothing of their purpose. This is a little more than me nitpicking however and it's fair to say that these examples are so infrequently relevant that they have a minimal almost nihil effect on immersion. And that's another key factor besides the luxury of barely having to wait for loading. Immersion. The world of Jack and Daxter is equipped with a day and night cycle that dynamically changes the lighting and colors as time passes and overall remarkable attention to detail the boot. When you reach the top of the Precursor Temple in Forbidden Jungle, for instance, you can see the Fire Canyon leading up to the Blue Sage's Hut in Rock Village, the large building from the Precursor Basin, and even the Zeppelin that's attached to the Boggy Swamp. These are obviously stages you will all visit later, and if you took the time to stare at the horizon in Forbidden Jungle, you'll be able to recognize those elements I've just listed when you actually reach those later stages. I often hear opinions from Mario fans how they prefer sunshine over the likes of Galaxy and 3D World because sunshine takes place in more grounded, connected worlds and Jack very much has that same appeal in that the world feels like an actual place with thought behind how to make it all come together in a believable fashion. Enough of me gushing about all that technical and interconnected world jargon though, let's move on to the last accessible area through Rock Village, Boggy Swamp. A few new mechanics are introduced here, the first of which being the Yellow Eco. Yellow Eco essentially allows Jack to turn turn into a street fighter bloke and shoot fireballs that can kill foes as well as destroy certain objects such as rocks that are blocking progress or the steel boxes holding precursor orbs as usual. It's not a particularly deep power up as it has a very generous aim assist but for a platformer like this I don't mind that too much. The purpose is more making you feel like a powerful badass not the accuracy in your shooting. The bad news is that this is the last type of eco for the whole game. Yeah we've only got blue, red and yellow eco for special abilities, so there is kind of a lack of power-ups. Power-ups are not a necessity by any means, but with a concept like eco, I think it would have been neat to have had more forms of it. If not that, each of them could have been more fleshed out and useful, rather than being more surface level gimmicks. Oh well. Next to Yellow Eco, Boggy Swamp also marks the first time we can use the Flut Flut. Riding this bird is sincerely a joy, cause it's so fast, can jump and flutter far, and the attacks can effortlessly dispatch enemies as well as bust open those steel crates. The moveset is not as deep or varied as Jack's, no, but the Flut Flut doesn't have a whole stage dedicated to it either, so it's never used too long at any time. The bird has to be unlocked though by pushing that egg off the cliff in Sentinel Beach. Assuming you don't do this, Flut Flut cannot be used anywhere in the game, and I think Boggy Swamp handles this idea very well. Flut Flut makes the platforming from bridge to bridge over this large swamp a complete non-issue, but if you don't have him, you can still clear the wide gaps between the bridges via the long jump. Doing so successfully requires more precision than you may expect, but it's absolutely doable. It's a great alternative for players who prefer not to do the tedious backtracking, which Naughty Dog demonstrates a few times 
times to be good with in Jack and Daxter. In the later Spider Cave 2, for instance, there are some precursor orbs that can only be obtained by Yellow Eco. Opening the nearby vent through a switch in Snowy Mountain certainly makes getting those eggs a hell of a lot easier, but those who realize they can grab Yellow Eco a bit further back into the level and are then fast enough to clear the distance to those precursor orbs without running out of Eco are never forced to come back later in case they hadn't opened the vent already. Arguably the most popular developer for the genre, Rare, got progressively more obsessed with tedious fetching over the course of the Nintendo 64's life, and I'm glad Naughty Dog neglected to take inspiration from Rare in that regard, instead coming up with a better compromise for the situations. This also marks a direct improvement over Crash, which, despite the linearity, is guilty of poorly thought out backtracking scenarios throughout the original trilogy. I digress though, very close by the Flood Flood and the Big Swamp is also a mini-game akin to the fishing in Forbidden Jungle. This time around, it's about a bunch of rats spawning at the other side of the swamp in three consecutively more overwhelming waves, and you gotta blast them apart before any of them reach the mushroom food near you. I give props to this mini-game because it's pretty difficult and intense without being unfair. You're shooting Yellow Eco from a first-person perspective, requiring you to actually line up your fireballs correctly along the x-axis, no auto-aim here, and you're constantly multitasking, considering you have to oversee a lot of the swamp at once in order to ensure no rat is slipping by unnoticed. This also forces you to make on-the-fly decisions about what target to focus on next, all of which meaning there is rarely a dull moment here. There is no nonsense about a stage being gated behind this mission either, so you can always opt to face the challenge later without having to worry about missing out on an entire level. It's merely a power cell. I'm not quite finished discussing Boggy Swamp, however, as there's something else interesting about it. It is without a doubt the stage with the least amount of options and choices of all the main stages. If all the other main levels in the game, besides Lost Precursor City to an extent, are open-ended where you can complete objectives at your leisure, then Boggy Swamp is one path from start to finish with little to no opportunity to diverge from that path and do things in different orders. This is not inherently a flaw, but Typically, the advantage of linear design is that concepts and gimmicks can be introduced and then gradually combined and or made more complex, safe in the knowledge that the player for sure is familiar with how it all works. The thing is about Boggy Swamp, it doesn't quite do that. The gimmicks related to platforming include logs that sink into the damaging swamp when stood on too long, sets of spikes that periodically eject from the ground, poles that Jack can swing on and jump off of, and the pairs of precursor mushroomish platforms where the one you stand on sinks down while the other rises up. Kind of like a weight balance, if you will. These are all good gimmicks on their own, but what's unfortunate is that they rarely increase in complexity, and I think the easiest way that could have been achieved is by having them intersect. Sometimes you land onto the sinking logs from the poles you swing on, but that's really as far as they go here. How about a part where you've got those periodically ejecting spikes in the middle of a swamp with no safe ground, and you have to manage your footing on the sinkable logs in the meantime? The difficulty could then be ramped up by having the ejection and retraction of the spikes happening faster, forcing you to sink up your landing onto the sinkable log so that you can then jump over the spikes correctly. Another idea is to have a high up platform that you cannot reach by yourself, but there's a pole to swing on next to a precursor weight balance. One side of the balance would have to be pushed quite far down in order to move the other far up, which you would then have to get on top of quickly with the height gained via the pole from where you can reach the high up platform. It's not like Naughty Dog isn't capable of shaping this sort of level design. The Crash titles, and then the first one in particular, was chock full of platforming gimmicks that increased in complexity over time and started combining. None of this is meant to imply Boggy Swamp is a bad level. No, it's totally okay. But if you're not gonna design to the strengths of linearity, why even bother? It's for that reason I think this main stage falls a bit short of all the others, ignoring Precursor Basin, because the linearity does come at the cost of something, that something being exploration and open-endedness. I am at least glad that the end of Boggy Swamp perfectly loops back to the start though, so when you're finished, it's straight the hell back to Rock Village. Back tracking in the scenario you miss something along the way isn't the biggest deal either because the stage isn't that long and you can take the end of the stage as your starting point. Say you couldn't beat the rats minigame before and intend to come back to it, you can get there in a totally reasonable time. You can even do the stage backwards right as you first enter it, which puts 
a novel twist on things, but checkpoints sadly don't register this way, so it's not that viable of an option. Bummer. Once you've collected 45 total power cells, the boulder claw dropped on Rock Village can be lifted and the game's second boss encounter is about to go down. This fight sees players jumping between three different platforms to avoid a series of boulders shot in their direction and then grabbing Blue Eco to summon a precursor bridge. From there, the rolling boulders must be avoided to find Yellow Eco by the end, which is then used to shoot Claw right in the fucking dick. I'm not kidding, the fireballs are absolutely tracking his crotch. Like the Dark Eco plant in Forbidden Jungle, this battle consists of three cycles, and with each cycle, Claw shoots the boulders at you faster while the precursor bridge has more gaps to fall into, making it trickier to prevent contact with the rolling boulders. As you'd expect, it's not a spectacular boss, but it's a decent test of reaction time and dexterity with the controls, and unmistakably more challenging than the Dark Eco plant, partially by the fact everything is suspended above a pole of instant kill lava. One element in particular that I get a kick out of is the track that plays in the background. It's unlike most of the score, as it's one of the few pieces that isn't there to support a certain atmosphere. Instead, it's got energy and aims more to be epic with its heavy percussion and brassy instruments, which gels better with the action of a boss encounter. Following Claw's boss fight is Mountain Pass, the second linear zoomer stage in the game. This time, there's no temperature meter to keep track of, but the potential of dying is higher due to the pass containing more pitfalls than Fire Canyon, and there's explosives littered all across the pass that reset you to the beginning upon a single touch. You can't take your all sweet time either, as you're racing a group of flying lurkers to the finish. Lose to them, and all the explosives are detonated at once, blowing up the whole canyon. This stage highlights the effect Blue E Eco has on the zoomer pretty well. With each ball of blue eco you grab, your max speed increases, maxing out at 4, and you can maintain that velocity as long as you don't let go of the acceleration or crash into something. It's super satisfying to go so fast and keep it up, and I wish this mechanic was used more extensively during zoomer sections. It's a great concept that unfortunately goes a bit underutilized. Something else worth mentioning about Mountain Pass outside of the driving itself is that it contains the one one and only collectible in the entire adventure for which backtracking is strictly necessary. You have to destroy an impeding rock with Yellow Eco, and the vent that supplies this Eco is activated in Snowy Mountain, an area you cannot visit until you've cleared Mountain Pass. I'm really not a fan of forced backtracking as I've made apparent, but mercifully returning to the spot is only about a minute long detour, and the realization to head back here after activating the Yellow Eco vent can make it worth the price of admission. The rock itself and the blocked vent don't really grab your attention as you're speeding by the first time either, so it's also a fairly well hidden power cell. You could argue the blue eco vent in Sentinel Beach, activated through the Precursor Temple in Forbidden Jungle, counts as forced backtracking, but that's only true if you happen to go to Sentinel Beach before Forbidden Jungle. The game's dialogue admittedly guides you to Sentinel Beach as a starting point, but this was probably used as a tool to teach players that some eco vents are opened in other stages more than anything else. Of course, on any subsequent playthrough, the player could easily go to Forbidden Jungle before Sentinel Beach as well, so I don't find that particular case, or the one in Mountain Pass for that matter, too offensive. These are still far cries from the crap you have to do in DK64 and, again, the original Crash Trilogy. Anyway, the Mountain Pass connects to the Volcanic Crater, which is the third and most barren hub of them all. There's little sign of life here, with only the duo of miners to talk to, but it makes sense for such a hot place to be devoid of activity and visitors. I actually kind of enjoy that aspect of the hub, it's got such an oddly relaxing vibe to it with the soft and mellow music and merely the sound of minecarts operating in the background. You even get to board the minecarts to reach a few of your destinations and though it's a slightly slow mode of transport, the rides are short enough that it's never a chore. Also, what Volcanic Crater may lack in NPCs, it makes up for with some actual story story development. When you go inside the Red Sage's hut and activate the teleporter gate, go- Hold the fucking phone! Did Samos just say fuck when he crashed out of there? Ow! Oh, fuck! I always wonder if I'm losing body parts in those things! Or am I just hearing things? 
Okay, sorry, got a little distracted there for a moment. When you activate that teleporter gate, Gala and his sister Maya crash the party and are finally properly established as the game's main antagonists. Gal used to be the sage of Dark Eco, but an unhealthy amount of exposure to the substance made him and Maya go mad. Now they've kidnapped the other sages and are plotting to harness all their energy to power a precursor robot that can open the silos. Massive artifacts which contain deep storages of Dark Eco. You know, the reveal of a villain was to be expected, sooner or later, as Gaul and Maya are shown up to be something fishy on Misty Island in the opening cutscene with all the lurkers. But as I've said before, it's notable that the story manages to have a driving force for so long without a tangible threat to the world and its inhabitants. What's even more notable is the plot twist that one of the antagonists is the only person who is capable of returning Daxter to his previous form. This is foreshadowed as Gaul and Maya leave behind part of Dark Eco in the opening cutscene, and Samos tells Jack and Daxter the next morning that Gaul is the only sage who studied Dark Eco. But regardless, it could definitely come unexpected, and by cartoony platformer standards, it's admirable to incorporate a shakeup of events like this. You've been playing through roughly 66% of this game, motivation being to restore Daxter, and suddenly the focus shifts to reaching Gaul and Maya Citadel and stopping their evil plans, leaving you wondering up to that point if Daxter is ever going to be on Sold. Wait a minute! That was Gull? The same Gull who's supposed to change me back? Gull is the guy trying to kill us? I'm doomed. The existence of the sequels does mitigate that last part, however, the Gaul plot twist on its own is still an intriguing one, and I think it makes the story as a whole a bit more enjoyable than it would have been otherwise. I'm just saying, it's not as if Gaul and Maya by themselves are strong villains. Their plans to destroy and then bend the world to their liking are stereotypical. They lack personality and bonding between each other for that matter with their generic dialogue, and they fail to come off as forces to be reckoned with. They just have no language lasting impression, and that's a shame because Cortex? Yeah, that motherfucker was pretty lit, especially in combination with Ugabugara's evil twin brother, Uka Uka. Part of the reason may be that Gaul and Maya barely get any screen time in order to set up the plot twist, but then I remembered my homies like Tiny Tiger, Embryo, Pinstripe, Entropy, Dingledile, Ripperoo, all more memorable opponents by their character design and quirky traits if you ask me, and none of these are ever the main bad guys, so... What went wrong here? At least the performances for Galamaya are up to par with the rest, which is a compliment because the voice acting on the whole is excellent. Eh? Countless games before this are filled with voice performances where it feels like the actors were pulled off the streets, poorly directed, or simply didn't fit the characters at all, often resulting in something that is considered classic and deliciously entertaining, but only because of how bad and stupid it really is. With Jack and Daxter, though, everybody sounds professional. There is not an instance I can recall where I found something to sound particularly out of place or in need of a retake. The highlight is of course Max Casella as Daxter. You could not have wished for a better duo, I think, as Casella understands Daxter and how the character should react to situations. I've got a power cell that says you can do it. Yeah, lightning moles. We can. Maybe for two power cells. This is one of those cases where I think the voice actor has a large part in defining the character. Daxter without Casella simply isn't Daxter, and if you ever find Casella's delivery grating, that's most likely because the character was written and directed in that fashion. Warren Burton as Samos is a tree too, and beyond the main cast, even the one-off characters have received competent acting. I love how the voice actor for the night in Rock Village can transition from his brave side to his defeated side so seamlessly. I climbed the hill to take him on, but he pounded me like one tenderizes a yakao steak. And the hillbilly accent for the loner in Boggy Swamp gets me every time. He wouldn't be nearly as fun of a character without that performance. Kevin Conroy even makes an appearance as he played the fisherman in Forbidden Jungle. <laughs> The 
The cutscene presentation in general is really clean, with the animation probably being the aspect most worthy of praise. There is none of that head bobbing and tilting when people are talking like in Metal Gear Solid or some awkward motion capture going on like in Sonic Adventure 2. And while the PS2 hardware helps over the PS1 and Dreamcast hardware, a large part of what brought such fantastic results is certainly Naughty Dog's talent with animation. It's not merely the smoothness of it all either. I could not spot any reuse of loops or cycles to save on production time and budget, and every bit of animation perfectly complements a character's lines and thoughts to make them come truly alive from small hand gestures to facial expressions. Heck, even characters that are not the main focus of the shot almost always are fully animated with their own reactions to situations. Jack is sightseeing whenever Kira isn't looking his way and acts as though he's concerned all of a sudden the moment she looks around here in Rock Village. Baxter can be seen giggling when Samo slam dunks on his head from the teleporter gate in Volcanic Crater while Kira is more concerned and gasps. And in the scene before the final boss, Daxter waves his hand in front of his face when Samos talks near them, indicating that Samos apparently has stinky breath. This sort of attention to detail is constant, and though I still wish cutscenes could be skipped, the fact I can always be on the lookout for something I hadn't noticed about the animations before softens the blow somewhat. Combine that with the voice acting as well as the great camera work, and the bar for cinematic storytelling in video games had absolutely been raised. Snowy Mountain is the first stage connected to the volcanic crater and some buffoons have said that the last third of the game isn't as good as the rest, that it's annoying and tedious, for that I say bugger off, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Snowy Mountain, I believe, is one of the best stages. For starters, it has a remarkably strong layout with fantastic flow. It's a large stage with a lot to do and see, but it's never confusing to navigate or a big time sink to get around in. When you enter the level, there are three pathways to take, with path A being the one with the rolling snowballs, path B being the shortest connection from the stage entry to the central area, and path C being the one with the narrow walkway and the large patch of ice with with a handful of precursor blockers. When you're done with path A, you can jump off the cliff here to quickly go to the central area, path B speaks for itself since it's literally just a connection, and path C splits again into two directions, both of which ultimately lead to the same central area. Then from this central area onwards, there are more sections to explore and take on, such as the Lurker Fortress and the cave with the yellow eco switch. These sections all sport more focused platforming and combat challenges, yet they have a loop back to the central area or a fast way out when you're done from where you can painlessly reach another part of the level. Probably the two objectives spaced furthest apart from one another are the lurker infested cave and the flood flood section that you need to complete in order to open the lurker fortress. But once you leave the lurker infested cave, you have like three options of routes you could take to reach the flood flood part. What's awesome is that none of these routes take up a significant amount of time and all of them contain collectibles or something else important to a larger mission. So if there's a route between that and the central area you have not taken before, you can take it now. And guess what? Once you're done with the flat flat to open the Lurker Fortress, a new shortcut is created that takes you right back to the same central area in a matter of seconds. Seriously, the construction of Snowy Mountain is ace. It's probably the largest and most open-ended stage up to this point in terms of what order you can complete objectives and collect stuff in, which by itself is already marvelous, and the efficiency at which this is possible is the icing on the cake. There are other things I like about this stage as well. Anything featuring Flood Flood automatically gets my genitals tingling, and its section has pretty cool and intimidating platforming, despite it being less scary than it may initially appear. It's just such a stinker, this is the last we see of the Flood Flood. I'm not kidding, only two sections with the birdie are in the whole journey, which is very disappointing, considering a screen time in both cases feels like it's over before I want it to be. To soften the pain, you can get get Flood Flood outside of his intended area through a glitch which absolutely breaks the stage yet is super satisfying regardless. It is no replacement for more actual content catered to the bird though. Anyway, another reason I greatly enjoy Snowy Mountain is because this is the point where the environments are becoming considerably more lethal. In many cases, gone are the safety nets like swamp water for failing a jump. While there are still spots you merely fall down and have to carry yourself back out of, you're on a mountain you know, so potential for falling off the map is much higher than before. The difficulty isn't merely increased by more pits either as the lengths of many gaps and heights of many jumps have expanded far enough to 
that a double jump plus spin kick or long jump is necessary to make it. This is not really or at least not often seen in any level before, so it's clear that the developers expected players to have a finer grasp of the nuances of the controls and mechanics by now. Uh, the Lurker Fortress is also pretty cool as it doesn't see you just swinging on poles like in Boggy Swamp, but you now gotta time your jumps off of poles correctly in addition, or save a shoddy attempt with a spin kick to land on moving platforms. Making mistakes is more punishing too as you'll have to do at least half of the obstacle course again rather than take a hit and carry on from there. The Ice Physics further add to the trickiness of Snowy Mountain. Ice Physics in the grand scheme have kind of a bad rep, one of the reasons being that they force you to get used to altered movement of the main character, but as long as they aren't janky and unpolished like Jay's reviews video on this game, I simply view Ice Physics as another gimmick to add onto the pile. After all, a large part of keeping level design in platformers diversified and engaging is continuing to introduce new gimmicks. It's not like you'll have to learn a whole new mechanic with its own intricacies here, Jack's moveset and abilities remain very much the same, so it's merely a matter of adjusting to the twist put on your momentum. And there is enough ice in safe spaces for players to do just that before moving on to harder sections. What is unfortunate is that the ice physics are only used as a means of hindering players, as in players need to accustom and account for the effects they have on Jack. Landing on these precursor blockers surrounded by force fields that knock you back is only turned into a proper platforming task due to the ice physics, and it works fine in my opinion. That said, the ice physics could also have been used in ways where players must manipulate them as a tool to their advantage. The simplest concept to achieve something like that would be to have players build up speed on the ice to cross gaps impossible without the extra momentum, and then pull back as soon as they land on the next slippery platform to prevent themselves from sliding off. It's a missed potential with the ice physics worth bringing attention to. They are kind of tossed in in the most rudimentary fashion possible, but thankfully the ice physics never become too frustrating to handle, so they're not a horrible sin or anything. The other stage connected to the volcanic crater is Spider Cave, and just like Snowy Mountain, I don't quite see what makes this a lesser level compared to all the others. In fact, I think it's pretty dope and another one of my favorites. This begins with the foreboding atmosphere. Dark Eco is everywhere here in the form of big ass pools, but it's also coming from various creatures such as the spiders, and the place has a very muted color palette with subdued greens and blues being most predominant. At the same time, I don't find the environment and boring to look at whatsoever because there are brighter sources around. Think of the torches placed here and there, the yellow eco vents that can be spotted from miles away, and the crystals along the walls emitting some green or blue light. It's certainly the darkest level, but the artists managed to make it visually striking in spite of that due to their excellent yet sparse use of contrast in tiny elements. The music deserves credit as well, blending into the mood and setting graciously with the church bells and twisted, distorted cellos behind the intimidating base. An outstanding atmosphere doesn't make an outstanding stage by itself, of course, but Spider Cave is also very good in the gameplay department. It's probably the most punishing and difficult stage of the entire game, which is quite appropriate since this is likely to be the last area people visit before they proceed on to Gaul and Maya. The central chamber is massive and has many of these spider webs that act like trampolines to get you to higher areas, and a good amount of collectibles and objects are to be reached by jumping between all of these floating precursor platforms platforms. They move around quite a bit, some of them up and down, some of them left and right, some of them diagonally, and screwing up a jump could well have you falling into a pit or down to the bottom floor, forcing you to make your way back up again. This central chamber then connects to two other interesting sections in Spider Cave, the first being the one in near pitch black. The idea is that you light up the area by smacking these crystals that emit a green glow upon being hit, and you have to reach the next crystal quick enough or else you'll be squinting your eyes to know where the fuck you're even going. I wish the section went on a touch longer and wouldn't be as afraid to actually throw you in the dark. There was certainly more tension and time pressure in some of Crash's limited light challenges, but it's a neat gimmick regardless that puts the lighting engine to competent use beyond eye candy. The room with the precursor robot the lurkers are building for Gaul and Maya though? <laughs> oh, this is the best one, centering around overcoming a gigantic obstacle course. There are so many gaps to clear 
clear a variety of hazards to avoid, collapsing platforms to deal with, enemies with drill dozers interfering, and making a mistake anywhere can again have you returning to an earlier part of the obstacle course or reset to the very beginning if you're unlucky enough to drop to the bottom. It's not mega hard to clear or anything, but it's not to be underestimated either because impatience and careless actions can cost a lot of time trying to make your way back to where you were. So many elements come together remarkably well here with the pool of gimmicks and hazards mixing and matching to create something that tests the player's precision with the controls and their sense of timing on top of that. Spider Cave in general feels like it gives concepts that won't return anymore their final push of difficulty, such as the pole swinging which now occasionally requires players to drop downwards to a pole below them as well. This is considerably trickier work than any pole swinging done before because there is no safety net in the form of spinning in midair when you launch yourself straight down and finagling yourself through surrounding poles you don't want to grab onto when trying to move down isn't quite so simple. Yellow Eco gets its send off here for on foot use too, if you don't count the final boss, but Please disregard that for the sake of me making this argument. Whereas in Boggy Swamp and during the Claw boss fight, you could unleash the fireballs like a maniac, in Spider Cave you have to actively aim in first person mode, up, down, left and right, to snipe off all the bugs crawling along their pillars. You're gonna have to find suitable vantage points as well as calculate where to shoot your yellow eco in order to hit the bugs successfully, because they speed up more and more the closer they are to being obliterated. I know people tend to not be fond of this mission, but I can get behind it for the reason it gives yellow eco a good challenge beyond blindly button mashing. Another yellow eco application here I really like is how you have to carry the power up into different rooms where yellow eco is not available in order to destroy some crates with precursor orbs. And this is then taken to its logical limit when you have to take yellow eco from out of spider cave into volcanic crater to blow up a steel box that contains a power cell. This power cell is sweet because it requires genuine out of the box thinking to nab in addition to being quick on your feet to make it to a volcanic crater with enough yellow eco juice. I vividly remember discovering this one without resorting to a guide and it was the most gratifying experience finally 100% completing the game by myself. What I consider perhaps most impressive about Spider Cave though is how open-ended it manages to be without sacrificing platforming quality. Taking the precursor robot room as an example, there are many different ways to reach various set pieces, all with their own precursor orbs and maybe even scout flies. You can take the obvious starting point via this bridge, but you can also long jump from there to another part of the obstacle course. You can take the trolleys in the upper right corner of the room to switch between floors immediately, and you can even go to the group of poles on the left side here which then starts you further at the top and you work your way from there. This isn't even mentioning that the floors themselves can branch off so they're not all even connected at one end. The central chamber I've talked about before is similarly open-ended being kind of a circle with stuff to do and find at many heights and different locations. I simply love having so many options on where to go next because it means that no playthrough is ever the same unless you carefully plan out the fastest one you can find and practice it, which can also be satisfying to do in its own way. Thankfully, this is something most stages in the game do quite well. Spider Cave and Snowy Mountain simply do it best though. Spider Cave is not as intertwined and efficient to travel across as Snowy Mountain, I will say that, but that may be for the better. Spider Cave is large and relatively complex already, to the point that newcomers are likely to find it a bit confusing to navigate and can get lost. While I think the section with the precursor robot is well designed in that regard and shouldn't be problematic, the central chamber could have used more recognizable landmarks and set pieces to help players identify more comfortably where they are and where another place they want to go to is in relation to them. This is definitely an issue with Spider Cave and if that's the reason people aren't too keen on the stage, I can totally understand that. There's also no doubt in my mind that many have felt frustration scouring the stage for a few remaining precursor orbs they've overlooked. Heck, I went through that pain myself. One spot is troublesome in particular, with eggs floating above this swinging pole. Chances are you missed these entirely due to the camera angle of all things, obscuring them. One could notably fall for this if they're playing in 16x9 widescreen, because rather than extending the viewing area to the sides, the setting in reality chops a certain amount off the top and bottom of the image. It's as if it's zoomed in. 4x3 
for that reason, technically gives you the superior play experience, but keep in mind that the cutscenes are letterboxed in 4x3 mode, since all the shots are composed in 16x9, so there is a trade-off. Unfortunately, camera controls are not gonna compensate for you on this front, because tilting the right analog stick up or down zooms in and out on jack respectively, rather than panning the camera up or down. Such a zoom function has no practical use for anything, so I don't know why they did it that way, but to be completely fair, this is the only conspicuous problem I've encountered with the camera, and it getting trapped on something once in a blue moon, I guess? And while I would have rather had true widescreen and the ability to point the camera up and down, the game seems to be designed with these quirks in mind for the most part. Alright, once you've collected a total of 72 power cells, the ability to travel to the final area, Golemaya Citadel, finally opens. This is done through the Lava Tube, which is the last of three linear zoomer levels. The difficulty is ramped up once again, with more pitfalls and narrower paths to ride on, and the road often splits into at least two. These splits are put to decent use by having collectibles on only one of the routes, meaning you'll have to pay attention to which side you're taking, or turn around and go back in case you missed something. The process of this could easily lead to the zoomer overheating, especially since the distances you traverse without cool spots are considerably larger than in Fire Canyon. What's odd though is that the first half is the most dangerous with the second half containing far less heated ground. I definitely would have liked to see the time limit be stricter here, encouraging players to keep picking the right routes with cooling balloons on them or the longest jumps into the air to cool off as much as possible that way. Alas, there there's no reason to think about where you're going in the latter half of the level, so you can do whatever you want, really. Nonetheless, Lava Tube is a fine conclusion for the Zoomer. As we approach the Citadel, Kira informs us that time is almost up with Lurker armies growing steadily across the land, and that her father has now been kidnapped by Gaul and Maya as well. To nobody's surprise, your job is to fight your way through the Citadel and rescue Samos, in addition to all the other sages that have been kidnapped before Daxter was even turned into an Otzel. The plan, then, is to combine the power of the four sages once freed, to destroy the force field surrounding the precursor robot that Golamaya want to use, to open the dark eco silos. I find it odd that you only now see the various other eco sages. To me, it would have been cool had you found each one as you reached their corresponding hut, and then they are kidnapped by Golamaya behind the heroes' backs whenever they ventured off to the next hub. The sages are not earth-shattering characters or whatever, but some of them seem quirky enough that it'd be cute to run into them as you progress your journey across the continent. I'm gonna give Gaul and Maya a little payback for this embarrassment. Then we'll see about cooking up some muskrat stew. Now, from a level design perspective, the Citadel is fairly simplistic. Essentially, 90% of the stage is a gigantic abyss with only small walkways to get around on, and big, circular platforms spinning around at different speeds to jump between. It is treacherous for sure, and you'll have to be pretty good with Jack's moveset to avoid falling into the nothingness below, but nonetheless, the challenges are pretty straightforward. Besides that, each of the three sages is locked behind an obstacle course, and these can be taken on in any order you like through the center room. There's really no advantage to doing one over the other first, since they're all linear paths with their own separate, self-contained challenges, but the choice to pick where you want to go next is cool, I guess. The yellow sage route is the concept of the blue eco launch pads, for some reason, taken to its limit, seeing Jack being launched over an enormous black pit with only two or so moving launching pads available the rest on and proceed from each time. The timing is overall forgiving, so it's not as tough of a task as it sounds, but going through this makes you feel like a badass nonetheless, and it is a decent way to give the blue eco launch pads one last push of difficulty. The red sage path is another one of those combat ambushes, and I've set my piece on those, although it is cool that you at least have to figure out to take down the lurker generators, or else you cannot move on. Lastly, there is the blue sage course, which comes down to more platforming with very, very few safe places. It's punishing in the sense that dying at any point sends you back to the beginning, but other than that, there is little in the way of complexity. It's simply bigger gaps. There may be a fire hazard interfering here and there, but it's nothing we haven't dealt with before. To be honest, I think Golemaya Citadel is a bit underwhelming. I'm not necessarily talking about the stage being relatively easy either. It's simply that 
that it isn't all that imaginative and only escalates difficulty in the simplest ways possible. I mean, yeah, the blue eco launch pad stuff is neat, but is that really all they could come up with? A giant black hole and some launch pads here and there? Similarly, the platforming in the blue sage course could have been longer and more involved. I for one know I would rather have had damn tricky timing and precision obstacles with checkpoints sprinkled around rather than this dull short shit with no checkpoints. The only gimmick that's kind of clever is the one where players must jump on color-coded platforms and every time they land on a certain color that means all platforms of the same color disappear. It's nothing too major but making it across and collecting all orbs along the way without dying requires some pre-planning of where to land with each jump which is a nice touch and involves more than just wide large gaps and throwing as many foes at the player at once as possible. The stage could have benefited from more unique gimmicks like this I think and taken them to the next level you know? And this is kind of a point of contention for all of Jack and Daxter though. Throughout this video I've highlighted for various stages how I think this concept and that idea could have been evolved more. It's by far the most noticeable in Golemaya Citadel but it would have been neat if Boggy Swamp took more advantage of its linear design. It would have been neat if Flood Flood made appearances more often. It would have been neat had the ice physics in Snowy Mountain been used in more creative ways. It would have been neat if there were more forms of eco or if the existing ones were pushed further and you could go on for a little longer. This is by no stretch of the imagination a deal breaker. I mean a lot of games fall short of reaching their ultimate potential and properly exploring all the great ideas that they have if you analyze them to pieces like I do. But yeah it does feel to me like this adventure could have been fleshed out a tad more with level gimmicks pushed further and also an overall higher difficulty. Now maybe I'm saying that last part purely out of an adult perspective. After all Jack and Daxter is meant for players of all ages and skill sets but not nearly all missions are necessary to be completed in order to progress and ultimately reach the final boss you know. I don't think it would have hurt to include some significantly harder power cell objectives here and there that players who are not skilled enough can totally skip over while those who want the extra challenge can stretch their platforming legs and get their balls busted. The Crash games, all of the OG trilogy, are certainly more challenging to 100% than Jack and Daxter and they achieved exactly that by having the optional side content like special routes and time trials being more difficult. What Jack does have over Crash to be fair is that intricate moveset which as I've talked about before can make even the simplest of objectives and stages challenging and interesting for those who want to achieve certain goals in unintended ways or perhaps even speedrun. The skill floor is low if you're playing the game casually but the skill ceiling is surprisingly high if you're looking to master it. What's absolutely worth mentioning as well is that a part of why Jack and Daxter feels as easy as it does is how well designed it is. The controls are smooth as butter and responsive, there is no live system and there's barely anything present in terms of cheap enemy placement and general unforeseeable bullcrap. Checkpoints are also plentiful which means you never lose much progress in case you do kick the bucket. This sometimes does come at a bit of a cost like in Golemaya Citadel with the color coded platforms. If you die during those sections the orbs you've collected stay in your pocket and all the platforms respawn so that really diminishes the intensity of the gimmick. But for the most part the game being forgiving works very well and the benefits to be had are equally as valid. Even though there are genuinely hard games out there without a doubt there are also also that owe a lot of their difficulty to the wrong reasons and you have to wonder whether that's any better than a relatively easy but very fair and accessible title like Jack and Daxter. And it's not that you'll never miss jumps, fail missions or outright die, you more than likely will, you just won't think much of it due to the lack of sizable punishments. Are you still awake over there buddy? I hope so because we are finally reaching the home stretch of the game and this video as such and thus also the end of my voiceover sessions. God damn dude I want to be done. Once all the sages in Gaul and Maya Citadel are rescued your efforts turn out to be to no avail as the precursor robot is ready to launch and break open the dark eco silos. The final boss is now upon us and it's surely the best boss in the game. Where the dark eco plant and claw only sport one or two attacks and then ran up the intensity each cycle, Golemaya give you a new attack to observe and overcome every cycle as you are shooting Owen Wilson's nose with yellow eco. Wow. 
This goes a long way to keeping the fight engaging for the time it lasts, and though it stays in line with the tame difficulty level of the overall adventure, you do have to stay on your toes and react decently if you want to win. In spite of that, it's a fair final boss with well-telegraphed attacks, plus it uses the actual base mechanics. I'm glad Nunny Dog never made the same mistake again as they did with Crash 2. As a matter of fact, the showdown with Golemaya may be one of the best boss battles, if not the best boss battle, Naughty Dog had created up to that point, but considering the Crash games largely had average to bad bosses, that ain't saying a bunch. The quality of the spectacle on display here is impressive, however, and it's not surprising this is the same developer that would go on to create the Uncharted series. The premise of fighting Golemaya in the very moment that they are attempting to break open the silos that you are walking on is a pretty epic setting by Collectathon standards, and every time Golemaya drop a bomb on the silos to break it open further and further, there, you'll be launching Jack high into the air off of a blue eco pad, watching those explosions reveal more and more of the dark eco inside. What is perhaps my favorite and most nostalgic piece of music in the game sells it all, which is also a good demonstration of a dynamic soundtrack at work. In this case, instruments are layered over with each attack cycle. As the boss comes to a close, the combined power of the green, blue, red, and yellow sages creates light eco. This is the type of eco that could turn Daxter back to his original form, but he has to consider between that and saving the world. Daxter finally does something that isn't purely self-centered, albeit not hardly, and opts for the choice of using the light eco to destroy Gal and Maya. This part makes no sense to me though. Multiple balls of light eco drop from the sage's powers before delivering the final blow, and even then, couldn't the substance be created again now that all the sages are free? I mean, I get it, they wanted to keep the guy the furball he is for the possibility of sequels, but the writing should have given a more believable reason as to why this trade-off had to be made in order to save the world. Regardless, the precursor robot gets obliterated, Golemaya sink into the depths of the dark eco silos, and Jack and Daxter do their little victory dance on the way back to the rest of the crew. Samos hints at Golemaya probably not being dead, and then the credits roll after a really cruel interruption by Daxter. Wow! Put it on ice, big guy! Assuming you've collected at least 100 out of 101 power cells, a post credit scene plays where an ancient precursor door is open to reveal a stunning light. Then the game returns to the title screen. It's a fine way to close the curtains and have a sequel be able to go wherever the developers would want, but it's definitely a disappointment from the perspective of going the extra mile to amass practically all the power cells. It's a very common collectathon problem to hand out completely unsatisfactory rewards for completion, and though I mainly 100% collectathons because of intrinsic motivations, I am not going to excuse Jack and Axter for a lack of extrinsic value. Crash Team Racing has a variety of unlockables like new courses, characters, and a neat scrapbook video showing the history and cores of the franchise. And in Jack 2, 3, and X, you can unlock cheat codes, a level select, the ability to rewatch all their cutscenes in a new game plus mode, depending on how many collectibles you've got. And this original installment seems as though it should have contained at least some of the extras listed above as well, because the development cycle was probably long enough to allow for that. Alas, we have to do without any fancy smash fancy bonuses here. On the surface, the Precursor Legacy may not impress much anymore these days. People have said that the characters you meet and the world you explore feel boring and lacking of context compared to platforming contemporaries like Banjo-Kazooie and Sly Cooper, or even when stacked against Jack 2 and 3 directly. And very little about the core gameplay is revolutionary or innovative here. I can definitely understand those complaints, and the game also isn't particularly long, in addition to the fact I think the level design, as well as a handful of mechanics like the 
Flood, Flood, and Eco have missed potential in some ways. All the same, Jack and Daxter is a very good title in my opinion, on the ground that it is such a solid and consistent experience all the way through with practically no low points. From the minimal amount of backtracking to nearly each stage having tons of platforming and obstacles to overcome, and from the strong difficulty curve to the large absence of poor design to the major focus on one playstyle, the game is rarely ever frustrating and instead easy to pick up and play, and then 100% complete all over again. Sure, yeah, I may not enjoy Precursor Basin and Boggy Swamp as much as the rest of the adventure, but by all accounts they are still decent stages, and if there are objectives or levels you really cannot stand, chances are high you can ignore them because you don't need nearly all power cells to progress. It's an undisputed crime, cutscenes cannot be skipped, that's one of my biggest personal gripes overall to be honest, but I can get over that if I have to. If you've never played Jack and Daxter before, I wholly recommend giving it a shot folks, collect a ton aficionado or not. Notwithstanding character models in cutscenes, it has aged delightfully in its presentation, and it plays just as well as it did back when it was released, including that amazingly engineered, interconnected world almost entirely free of loading. There are of course things other collectathons do better or have over this game, but the Precursor Legacy is one of the most straightforward and bullshit free to play and complete within the genre, and that's worth a lot.